Okay, folks, happy Friday. And we're going to, what do you think I'm going to say? Pick up the same place we left off? Yeah, of course we are. So we're going to punt a little bit. We're going to move this T28 to the side. And uh, we're going to we're gonna glue these two tanks on the, um, on the base that we should have ready for them. Better have ready for them. Plenty dry before it gets before it gets too dry and it hardens up too much ends up being like a kind of a liquid rock. I've got three glasses over here. It's collecting the collecting readers. I was wondering where they all were. All right, let's get the super readers on. There we go. I don't like using these for a whole lot of stuff. I feel like uh, makes your eyes lazy, and then you gotta. You know, keep doing it. All right, so we're gonna put move the uh, phone off to the side. We're gonna need that to search for some decal inspiration soon on the T28s. We got some coffee with us, so that will make sure that we don't fall asleep in 30 minutes. I know a lot of people are night owls. I'm not one of them. And let's. Put this. This is where we're going to glue this joker down. And she's pretty wide. Actually, let's do this a little bit more. Um, let's put some more thought into it. How wide are the tracks in millimeters? It's like just shy of 10. It's pretty wide. All right, and the other one is about here. All right, we'll just cut everything out of that groove. We'll scoop that out. And do the same thing on the other side. Angel, how you doing, man? Happy Friday. Assuming you don't have to work tomorrow, in which case it would be sad Friday. I'm not a fan of Fridays until now. Not until now. Because the beginning of the morning, I, I detest Fridays. I'm more out from the whole week. Nobody wants to do anything at work, but yet they still have to. You know, it's just a pain in the butt. Like I said, the guy that created TGIF was working four tens. <laughs> no work tomorrow. There you go. A person with a normal schedule, unlike Mitch. <laughs> All 
that. So we're going to, that gives us enough area that this can glue and be relatively flush. Doesn't have to be perfect. But I'm actually going to do something different this time that I've not done before and see how it works. I don't know if it's going to be successful, but we're going to give it a shot. Just trying to improve a little bit and save myself some headache. So this is the scraping area, how I like it. So I'm actually going to go back and I'm going to paint this area in um, chocolate brown. So what ends up happening is sometimes some of the white shows up um, through this um, through the tracks because this is actually a pretty good model from the standpoint that you can actually see all the way through it. So I'd hate to have a little bit of that lighter color in there where it stands out. So we're going to try to do that on these two tanks and see if it makes a difference. And um, you know, and if it doesn't, then we won't do it again. So we're going to do the same thing with this T26. Well, kind of had a little bit of a change of plans. I know, Angel, you, tied, you, you uh, signed in earlier in the week and I talked about it. I was saying there wasn't going to be a show tomorrow morning because I was going to be traveling and my travel plans got moved one day. So there will be a show tomorrow morning. There will not be one on Sunday. So we'll do this again in the morning. I will be out of, out of um, town. I was going to say out of pocket, but that's actually not a term I use. I know what it means, but out of pocket. What is that? Out, out of pocket sounds like you're out of money. You just... I'm out of pocket. There's nothing in my pockets left. All right, let's scoop this out. Of course, this one isn't as noticeable because it's black. So why is this one black and the other one's white? Well, so I had all these extra shims from work that they didn't want, which make a great base, but there's a fixed length, they're a maximum of like two and a half or three inches or just shy of three inches or something like that. And some of these larger vehicles, like the SUs, are too long to fit on there properly. So I had to find another means. And the other means is going to Hobby Lobby in this case and buying some sheet styrene. And eventually when I run out of these little, the black shims, I will, um, yeah, they come like this. They actually come connected to them, and they're super high strength. They're basically shims for putting pieces of concrete, so they can definitely withstand a whole lot of weight. And they didn't want them to work. I'm like, well, I can put them to good use. You know, I actually can't really buy them again because they're they don't really sell to the public, and they're you know I'd have to buy so many of them that it would be. Cost prohibitive. I think I did the math and I got to spend like $150 on the ship. I'm like, okay, we're going to find another, we're going to find another uh, source of those. So I saw that Evergreen makes a, a point, a, a two millimeter thick um, sheet styrene. So that's what we, that's what the white sheet is that we've been using. for the larger vehicles. That'll eventually be, all of the vehicles will be on that. Unless somehow I just decide to give up on doing any more vehicles at some point, which I don't really see that being the case. As much as some of you might be wondering, why am I even putting vehicles on a base? It's amazing how much sleep people, some people seem to lose over decisions that other people make on stuff, you know? And one of the one of the guys that I watch, I, I don't, I haven't watched him in a while because I'm creating my own content. But on YouTube, um, just posted. He said, "Well, sorry about this rant," and it wasn't really a rant. He was just kind of complaining about 
Apparently, he posted some some videos of um, of doing some techniques on something, and some guy came after him, like you know, some guy with no purpose, complaining and ranting about why he did something, how his stuff is no good. The guy's a pretty decent modeler, as far as I'm concerned. So, I don't know what I don't know what this one guy said, but I mentioned to him, I said, you know. One thing that saves a heck of a lot of headaches that I learned pretty early on is if you make a video, I don't think he does live stuff. I think he, you know, goes and makes the video and then posts it on there. I moderate all my comments and I wish I didn't have to do that, you know, because all of the regular people know how to behave. But you get people occasionally that come in. One, one guy came in one time and was wanted to start a jihad or something like that. And, um, and you know, I, if you make it so that you know, I have to basically approve people's comments before they come on. Um, it does, it does affect some people. They may not want to comment on it, but it keeps me from putting out a video, uh, going through all the trouble of making some video, and then uh, some uh, person that wants to cause problems in the middle of the night um, posts a bunch of things that have to be corrected or need to be taken down, and and kind of start feeding the audience in a different direction. So. In order to keep my sanity, I'm like, I gotta make it so I gotta moderate all comments because somebody could come in there and just create, you know, and, and just create all kinds of chaos. And then the next thing, you know, the next morning I gotta go to work and now I can't, you know, I've got, I gotta do all this damage control. So the easiest thing for me is just to, at that point, just to moderate all comments. And it's been pretty successful, you know. You want to be negative and you want to be, you know, be a dickhead, go be a dickhead somewhere else, you know? I mean, I don't, you know, I can be rude in person, and, but I'm a lot nicer on the internet. Because if you end up, you know, if you end up saying stuff that, you know, you don't want to, and all of a sudden you got to defend your position and stuff like that, just like, you know what, if you see stuff, I see stuff all the time on the internet I don't like, I don't feel like I have to do some kind of commentary on it. So anyhow, um, that was my suggestion. Just moderate all your freaking comments. It's not that big of a deal. Or, or go crazy, your choice. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so that's that one's done there. I'm going to paint. But these guys, I was talking about my experience at the model meeting. There was one of these guys who was really trying to, like, hey, you need to enter this competition that we have. I, I don't want, you know, I don't want, I don't care what somebody else thinks about with the stuff that I paint. I really don't. Um, I just have to be happy with it. I do it for me. You know? Um, are we out of chocolate brown again? No. Yeah, that was, this was the old one. Mm. I, I knew we couldn't have been out of it. So I'm going to come over. We're going to paint. Now, I may not do this if somehow I have a problem with the, um, with the epoxy getting enough of a purchase on it. But we'll give this a shot because it, it may end up saving me some trouble. In particular, the inside. I could probably just do that, honestly. But we will see. But I'm pretty intolerant of I'm pretty intolerant of other people uh, poo pooing their other folks' hobbies, interests. You know, this could be somebody that maintains their sanity. You know, you could be responsible for you know making somebody snap and they turn into a serial killer and. You might be first on their hit list, you know? There's, there's, a couple of, there's a couple of Facebook groups that I subscribed to because I thought they were really interesting, <clears throat> the material that they had on there. But I realized, and I thought they were going to be like frequented by people that were like specialists of, of knowledge. One of them is a tank site, a tank predominantly, you know, historical tank uh, predominantly uh, site, 
And another one is a naval one. And what I've realized is there's a lot of people that are just looking in search for something to do because they, the stuff that just, you know, they, they go and just create controversy instead of like, you know, actually looking up their answers, you know, and it's like, you know, if it's legitimately something you can't find out, but if it's like almost like common knowledge, the stuff that they're posting and it's wrong and it just starts, it just starts leading people down a rabbit hole. And, um, yeah, I was painting tracks and then I just, I just got wore out. Yeah, let's, let's shore this, shore this up while this dries. It may not be in blue until tomorrow morning and that's just fine too. Let's get the SS Camel Black here. Yeah, this is somebody's therapy, man. It is for me. So I really don't care what anybody thinks about the stuff that I do. Now, if I get a compliment from somebody that I hold in really high regard of like their ability, yeah, that means a lot. And that happens a couple times. So that always feels good when you get stuff like that. But ultimately still, if I'm not happy with it, that's all that matters. And then we also have um, four, I think it's four T-35s to do. I know, why do I have so many T-35s? Guy was selling them for a dollar each. I'm not leaving those there. I'm pretty sure I can have a dollar's worth of entertainment out of it. I'll buy that for a dollar. <laughs> Some guy was just tired of looking at him, wanting him gone. That's from right a movie I've only seen one time and I'm actually looking forward to seeing it again because I remember by it when I saw it that's like the most violent movie I'd ever seen and it's probably lame you know by today's standards you know but I'm not gonna tell you what movie it is you guys are gonna have to guess it if you care or if you already know if you're my age you know what movie it is But I couldn't actually see that movie in the movie theater when it was because it was rated R. I wasn't old enough to. I was really close to, but it was just just a little too early. By, I think a year actually. Nineteen eighty seven. Yeah, it's a freaking dollar, man. I'm I'm not le I'm not leaving that there. Now, if it'd been too expensive, I wouldn't have gotten them because these are actually one eighty seventh scale instead of one seventy second or seventy sixth. But it's a game piece. 
and it's a decent looking game piece. It's not like it's a crappy thing. I mean, it's it's well made. It just happens to be a little on the small side. Luckily, they're vehicles that are pretty darn large. So, you know, not um, not as noticeable. No takers? Come on, you guys gotta know what movie that's from. Only saw that movie one time. anything here no yes that was a quick turn of events okay so we can rinse this Drinking coffee and yawning. That's pro level material right there. <laughs> All right, so this has got to dry now. And here is the two examples of the T28. Well, they're actually going to look like this one. This is the more modern, modern turret. And I did look at some examples of couple of vehicles here. The decal set made by Colibri, which is Spanish for hummingbird. I don't know why a Russian company calls their stuff that, but I don't know, maybe they're trying to be trendy. Here we go, this is a 185. This one actually has the, the radio, 185. All right, we're gonna do that one. And one of the one of these had not have a radio antenna on it. This one doesn't have a radio antenna. Nine and ten. What's the description on nine and ten? Well, there's another set of them here. Nine is a T-28 from the 53rd Tank Regiment of the 82nd Tank Division, 4th Mechanized Corps. Southwestern Front, July 41. Oh, here's some T-28s with longer guns. No, these are all short ones, the ones I have. Like the infantry gun, really, really short guns. number one 1936 
We did pick one that had the shorter barrel, didn't we? Yeah. We can do 185 through 367. Or 166. Gum barrels drilled out. What's the inside of this look like? Plastic? Okay, cool. We're going to go ahead and use weld cement for this. Okay, and then this is the other side. How was my week? It is, I'm not exaggerating with saying it's probably the most challenging week I've had in almost 30 years. In, in two months, I'll have been at the place where I'm at for 30 years. It's literally probably the most challenging week ever we're extremely busy and uh, and there's our company's very lean and uh, there's a lot of folks that um, are not there when you need them whether they're sick or it's just it's issues let's just say the days went by really fast which I guess is a good thing but extremely challenging it's one of those weeks that if it had been my first week there i would have quit <laughs> because it's just like you know trying to do too much like don't even know what to do but you know we got through it you know mr marcus happy evening we'll be back on tomorrow morning you missed that but i'm postponing my trip until sunday so sunday morning there won't be any but tomorrow morning we should be back on here so Go ahead and make breakfast early and then have a seat. <laughs> We're going to do the one with the radio antenna first. But we got through it. The weather was good, but... Um, Extremely challenging. Extremely, extremely challenging. I feel like I haven't highlighted these any. Uh, may not be it may not be accurate. You'll be on. Yeah, we'll save you a seat, man. You know where to find us. I don't I don't think I I don't think I did the lighter shade on here. I must have fallen asleep. That's okay. It's not a big deal. We can do it now. Let's do the two turrets and actually the little turrets also. Let's just say I don't think about my job when I'm not there. I think that's what's kept me sane. Um So, but it also makes me, when you're really, really busy, you're really not very sympathetic towards people that don't have a lot on their plate. So, You know, when it's like you can't even even you can't even use all your vacation days. I don't get that many vacation days, but I can't even uh, I can't even use them all. 
just I am working through painting a German pioneer team. I really haven't messed with them. I really haven't messed with pioneers at all. I really have not. Um, I got lots of cool ones. I even have some um, Soviet pioneers. But there's just some things there that are, when you think of them, there's certain nationalities, when you think of them, there's things, whether it's reality or not, there's some things that just uh, resonate or they're, you know, when you think of pioneers, we think of flamethrowers. I think of the Germans. I mean, yes, Marines use flamethrowers, the British use flamethrowers, the Soviets use flamethrowers. What do you think of, you know, Russians use bazookas, but when you hear bazooka, you don't think of Russians, you know? Uh, when you think, when I think of flamethrowers, it's, it's the freaking Germans. It's the freak, oh, it's the freaking Germans. Yep. Even when we used to play with those little NPC figures. Or the Airfix figures rebranded, but we have NPC in the states here. Even when we had those things, the most valuable, most valuable guy was the guy that was, you know, was running the flamethrower. Everybody wanted him. Now the good news is because I'm playing an actual scale, I can have a flamethrower that actually goes quite a bit of distance, and if it's vehicle mounted. It can go quite a, it can go quite far depending on which one. the The German flamethrower on the Panzer III actually has a pretty good distance on it. However, it get, it foregoes its main armament for it, so it's got a, still a machine gun on it, but it loses the fifty millimeter gun. So you got a Panzer III that's basically only armed with a flamethrower. As opposed to like a T-34, right? T-34 loses the whole machine gun to get a flamethrower instead of it. Cool, right? So, um, but not the German ones. They even have a flame hetzer. And I think it looks just like a hetzer. It's just, um, has a flamethrower on it. And a crocodile. Churchill crocodile. Flamethrower. Mark 7 Churchill with a flamethrower. What distance could it throw a flame? I'll look it up in a second. It's pretty far. It's pretty far. Over 100 meters. It's, it's like, it's impressive. Now, and I don't know if that's the same case all of them, but... Um, it's pretty far. You know, it's also higher up than a whole machine gun on a T-34. So. I'll look it up right now. Flampanzer III. I have one, too. It could spray a stream of liquid, unlit, inert oil to maximum range of 50 meters. Okay, sorry, not 150 meters. That's still a lot, man. That's, that's like 170 feet. That's, that's pretty far. Uh, so in game scale...
This is 15. So more than three times this. Yeah, that's pretty far. Uh, 50 meters increasing to 60 when ignited. So 60 meters. So you could like wet something up down at 50. And when you, when you lit it, it'd go up to 60. At a pressure of 15 to 17 atmospheres. Pressure was provided by a Kiba pump at a rate of 7.8 liters per second. The pump was powered by a two-stroke 28 horsepower Audio Union ZW 1101 DKW engine. Whew, there's a mouthful. Using a mix of oil and petrol. The flame fuel was ignited by electrical sparks from Smitzkurzen, Smith, which is Smith's glow plugs. These glow plugs were placed at the rear breech end of the weapon with counterbalance and pressure gauge. The flame gun was fed, was fed by 1,020 liters of fuel held in the vehicle's hull and two 510 liter tanks on either side of the drive shaft. The fluid reportedly consisted of a fuel thickened with tar. Ugh. But that smelled wonderful, giving a distinctive scent similar to creosote. A special connection to the flame oil delivery pipe allowed the turret to retain its 360 degrees of traverse. The flame gun and coax MG34 had an elevation range of plus 20 to minus 10 degrees. The weapons were fired via foot pedals, right for the flame gun, left for the machine gun. Horizontal traverse and elevation were achieved via hand wheels in front of the commander slash gunner. As a gunner and loader were unnecessary in a flame tank, the Flampanzer only had a crew of three as the commander now assumed the role of flame gun operator. He did remain in the standard position at the rear of the turret, however. Originally, the flame gun was aimed via an inverted V-blade sight in front of the vision blocks and the commander's cupola. Later, this was improved by adding a rod with range markers to the protective faux barrel of the flame gun. This was lined up with a thin stripe painted down the center of the vision port in front of the commander's cupola. The other two crewmen were typical, a bow gunner slash radio operator at the front right and a driver at the front left. So only one guy in the turret, the commander. So I actually have one of them. I have one of them completed. Where is the flamer? Here we go. It's the old ESCI kit. E-S-C-I. Oh, wrong one. That one is way too heavy to be plastic. Where is it? Oh, it's right next to it. Turned out pretty good. I specifically made it look kind of um, soot covered. Now you can't really use it for Stalingrad because they don't come in gray. <laughs> They're based on the M and the M, they weren't doing gray when the M came out. Some L's, but no M's. So they used them at, uh, they used them at Kursk and then seven, many of them got shipped off to, Af to uh, Italy. Many of them did. They made about a hundred of them. Now, I actually have three flamethrowers for the Soviets. <gasps> what do you mean? I said, well, I got an extra turret for this T-26. One of them is a flame th turret. And I have two of this Soviet T-26 with the aerodynamic turret the later production model one, the model 1939 turret. 
the sleeker one to do. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm, I don't know that I'm going to... I'm, I'm going to try to get both of these guys completed the next month and bring these to the... Okay, so it's so OT-130 if it's the early T-26 turret. And if it's the sleek one like this one, it's an OT-133. So I know what you want to know. How far can this one shoot? I don't know if you want to know that. I want to know it. Let's find out. Wargaming is educational. Okay, 100. All 100 Flampons are threes, these guys right here. Um, were placed in service in the following numbers. Division Bras Deutschland. 28. Got 28. 13 of these were transferred to 11th Panzer Division in spring 43. 1st Panzer Division got 14. 6th Panzer got 15. 14th Panzer got 7. 16th Panzer got 7. 24th Panzer Division got 14. And 26th Panzer Division got 14. I know 20... And... Schul, Schule Wundorf. What the hell is Schule Wundorf? Got one. Now, if you paint that one for Schule Wundorf, you got to make sure you pay, paint the right one. 26th Panzer Division, I think, was in Italy all the time. That's the one that has an insignia that looks like, I think it's like one of Frederick the Great's Grenadiers or something like that. Oh, I, I gotta read this. You're gonna like. You're gonna like this. This is the kind of stuff that we like in Italy. In Italy, in 1943, the first Flammpanzer unit was formed. It was attached to the first Flamm Company, attached to Panzer Regiment 26, so the 26th Panzer Division. Not always the Panzer Regiment number did not always match the name of the Panzer Division. In this case, it did. This was the first unit of its kind in the German Army. It consisted mostly of Flampanzers, but it also outfitted with self-propelled guns and tank destroyer confiscated from Italian units. Hmm. Maybe some Semoventes in there. First Flam Company and, and Pen... Whoa, what the hell happened here? Come on, I was reading. Why did you do that? Oh, I don't like it when it goes to big word, the big writing. I was reading something juicy. This is this is a good this is a good story. This is this is the kind of stuff that us war gamers can't get enough of. First Flam Company and Panzer Regiment Twenty Six were in action during the fight for the town of Mozagrogna. Mozagrogna. Yeah, that's how it is. Doesn't sound very Italian, but Moza, the Mozza part does. Mozagrogna on the twenty seventh and twenty eighth of November. I take it this is nineteen forty three. On the evening of the 27th, the Allies had managed to capture the town. The Germans responded early morning under the cover of darkness, surprising the Allied forces. A number of flams were used in this assault, pushing the attack and keeping the Allied infantry suppressed. A few of the Flampanzers were lost. Feldwebel Hoffmann, a commander-slash-gunner on one of the flame tanks, was killed by a shot to the head while assaulting field fortifications in the town. Another Flampanzer under the command of Feldwebel Block was lost when an artillery shell blew the track off and damaged the sprocket wheel of his tank. It was subsequently abandoned. Further action took place on the 16th of December, 43, on the road from Ortona to Orsagna. We know the details of this action thanks to a personal report from Oberleutnant Ruckdeschel of 2nd Flam Com Company, Serving with Panzer Regiment 26, the second Flam consisted of five Flam Panzers and two Stu S T U H 42s. So those are the those are the Stugs that have the 105 millimeter howitzer, as opposed to the 75 millimeter L 48, basically a Pac 40 in there. The unit was under the command of Lieutenant Tag T A G. 
The unit counterattacked Allied positions along the road under heavy artillery fire. The second Flamme supported the advance of Fallschirmjäger, turning their attention to enemies in dug-in positions. Under covering fire from the Stuhs, S-T-U-H, the howitzer ones, the Flamme Panzers pushed the assault of these positions, smoking out, how ironic, smoking out the defenders with deadly efficiency. During this action, one of the Flamme Panzers even managed to destroy, or at least immobilize, an Allied tank of an unknown model. Probably a Sherman. That's my money. Money's worth on the Sherman. Uh, the Panzer managed to sneak up behind the Allied vehicle, which was camouflaged under straw. <laughs> If you know you're going to be engaging flam panzers, don't put straw all over your vehicle. That's only going to make it worse. Um, the panzer managed to sneak up behind the Allied vehicle, which was camouflaged under straw, and cover it with flaming liquid. <laughs> the exact damage sustained to this vehicle or casualties inflicted on the crew is unknown. Uh, let's just say uh, you didn't want to be them. That's that's probably not good. So on the Eastern Front, the Flammpanzer was used slightly less extensively. The Flammpanzer Zug, so that's platoon, that was attached to Panzer Regiment 36. I don't know what unit that was. I don't know what Panzer Division had Panzer Regiment 36. It wasn't the 36th Panzer Division. They didn't go up that high. Prior to January 44, the Flammpanzer only seen combat twice. In these actions, the flamethrowers were used in the reduction of enemy fortifications and defensive positions. These actions were not great successes. Soviet forces were supported by a large number of anti-tank guns, as well as the terrain of their country. Anti-tank guns and flamethrower tanks don't work well unless the terrain is very restrictive. The flat, broad terrain, which lacked cover, combined with these anti-tank guns, caused a number of these losses to the flam panzer units, despite covering fire from gun-armed panzers. So here's something I've actually never seen before. Okay, here is a picture of a Schertzen equipped Flammpanzer. And I don't think I'd ever seen one before. It's pretty much Flammpanzers don't have Schertzen. You know, these these came out when all Panzer 3s basically had Schertzen on them. Um, never seen one with, with Schertzen. And not only that, it's very unusual to find uh, a, Flam, a, a Panzer 3 that does not have Schertzen on the turret, but has it on the hull. So another unique, uniqueism there. This one is number 651 of the 6th Panzer Division on the Eastern Front. In the first action, two flam panzers were destroyed. It was noted that while the tanks were flaming, <laughs> they were actually visible from long distances, naturally drawing the attention of attention of enemy anti-tank gunners. It was then decided that the Flammpanzers should only be used in areas with adequate cover, such as the central and northern areas of the Eastern Front. Even then, the cover had to be close enough to the enemy's defenses for the tank's flamethrower to be in range of any targets. That's right, there's no point somebody shooting at you unless you can flame back. Schertzen also started to appear on the Flammpanzers. In recognition of the limited deployment options, Flammpanzers in the south of the Eastern Front were relegated to guard duty in towns. In the later stages of the war, the number of operational Flammpanzers dwindled. A number of the flame tanks were assigned to Flam Panzer Flamm Company 351 in January 45 in preparation for Action Budapest. This unit was still in action until April 1945. Anyhow, they didn't read the three pig story. I bet there's a three pig story in German. But maybe the British didn't know about it. I don't know. I just said Allied. It could have been an American one. I'm putting my money on a Sherman. If it was a medium tank, it was a Sherman. Okay, so let's go, let's go to the OT-133. Tank. Okay, so 50 meters on this guy, or 60 meters. That's damn near 200 feet away. That's, that's pretty far. 
I mean, it is and it isn't. It's um, it's deadly for infantry because you can't throw a grenade or something that far. That's outside of the close combat range for infantry. Let's see what we have on this thing. Oh, here's just a drawing of it. <laughs> I looked it up and here's this review that I did of the unboxing of them. <laughs> yeah, this thing goes on Amazon for $21.99, that model. I ended up picking up two models for like eight bucks and like five dollars for shipping. So like for like fourteen dollars, I got two flamethrower tanks. I'm like, yeah, you can't beat that. But they are not for a um, uh, faint of heart. Oh, you know, this is the annoying thing about anything that's not German. They don't give the kind of details to the other stuff. Like, this is vague. OT-133 was third of a series of flamethrower tanks based on a T-26 light tank. And was built around the improved T-26S. The OT-133 carried the same model 1938 flamethrower as the OT-130, which would be the one based on this turret, which gave a normal range of 45 to 50 meters. The turret of the T-26S was moved to the right to make space for more fuel tanks in the hull. Like the OT-130, the OT-133 was used during the Winter War against Finland, where the short range of the flamethrower and the lack of any other armament made it very vulnerable. Ooh, lots of details there. Anyhow, we have a couple of the we have three Soviet flamethrower tanks we can do. We have the replaceable turret for this one, and then we have the um, we have the uh, the two of the later version. Okay, where were we? That was a fun distraction. Hey, we're here to learn shit, you know. Yeah, 50 meters, that's pretty far. That's pretty damn far. Now I'm inspired to paint again. I was gonna wait until tomorrow morning. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> My work here is done. I, I can't paint without being online. It's just like a waste of time. You know? I need some kind of interaction.
Just sitting here in the silence doesn't cut it. Listening to a book on tape doesn't cut it. I do like doing that if I'm like doing yard work or something like that, but. That's what we're here for, for inspiration. I get inspiration from other people's stuff. So anyways, we're going to, once we knock out these T-35s and T-28, we're probably going to go mess with those flamethrower tanks. Because the model meeting, that's what the, that's what the theme is. It's vehicles that carry ammunition, fuel, or something else. I'm like, well, that's a flamethrower tank. Now we need to glue this one down. And they actually had flamethrower tanks that were based on the Panzer I hull. They only used them in North Africa. They only made like 10 of them, 10 or 14 or something like that. The Flampanzer I is actually, if I remember correctly, a pretty decent looking vehicle. The Flamingo is not very attractive. The Flampanzer II. Based on an ugly model of a Panzer II. things to break off. All right, well, we'll leave it be then. I'm just going to make the hole a little bigger. Okay, how's this paint doing? We dry yet? No, that's a job for tomorrow morning. That is a job for tomorrow morning. I don't know if the Shermans were used with flamethrowers in Europe. I don't think I've ever seen pictures of them. It's always on Tarawa or somewhere like that. Philippines in 1944. Something along those lines. All right, so to the labeling. Let's drop that in the water. This can get out of the way. We have some live paint here. Move that out of here. Move it to the other desk. Grab another, grab a different cardboard to protect our table. To make cleaning it easier. And let's grab a cell phone, wherever the heck I may have put it. And a 
Okay, so this is going to be 166. So we're going to go ahead and make that one 166. So let's go ahead and get our wet powder. brush we can trust our life with. Sort of. So we're going to start with a six in the middle. And then we're going to make another six as close as we can to it. close as we can from a standpoint of looking like it. And does the one have any legs or anything on it? Looks like it's straight. I'm going to put a little bit of a leg in it. same thing on the other side. Start with a six in the middle. Of course, that's going to end up being weathered. It's the style the numbers are done in, at least in that decal. Tank 166. Okay. And the other one. I'd look for one that has a small. Wow, that's. That's really, really small up there. Fifty-two twenty-three. Yeah, 
That's 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 too. Um, All these have two, all these vehicles that, that only have, have a two different, two different numbers on it. What's this one have? A four? Okay. Let's put, um, Was that number? Fifty two twenty three. That's really, really small. Same thing on the other side. rectangular box around that. Same thing on this side. Okay, it also has that 5223 on the back here, like in a box also. And a rectangle. One thing you never see about T28s and T35s, for that matter, is you never see them with slogans. It seems like they all got knocked out of action before the Russians realized they were getting their ass beat and needed motivation for to write on the tank. Tank motivation. So we're going to go ahead and 
put this away and we're going to do the weathering. Feels a lot later than it is. Of course, I don't think I stayed up any day any later than this week, 9.45. I think 9.45 is the latest I stayed up one night. It was like 8.30 and I'm like, I want to go to bed. I mean, nothing was worth staying up for. It was just, you know. No point killing yourself. one US field drab And use the same colors that are going to appear on the, on the base of this vehicle. That ties it all in together. Like I said, you know, the um, the dry brushing works really well, but don't expect to just put one color and then call it a day because it's going to look like it just lacks depth. And you gotta remember, you got another color on here, so you can't go the whole hog and not leave any space for that other, for the Iraqi sand to go on there.
Yep, I'm already getting sleepy eyed here. Same here. <laughs> that was the delay. <laughs> so same here. Oh, going to bed early? Yeah, it's probably what it was. Yeah, I'm just... It's not worth it. That's not worth it. Mess up your whole day and possibly your own week if you do it on the wrong day. Play catch up the whole time. I think I'm going to scrub it too. We'll be back on by six o'clock for sure in the morning. But anyways, thanks for stopping by folks as always, and we'll catch you on Saturday.